What is up, my Andronauts? In this video, I want to talk about ashwagandha and anhedonia. There seems to be quite a trend about people saying that you should be avoiding ashwagandha because it can cause anhedonia. And this is creating a bunch of fear mongering because a lot of people can benefit from ashwagandha and now they just don't want to use it because they're so afraid. It's like this massive assumption that the DHT causes hair loss, despite so many people optimizing DHT, not getting hair loss, so many people using ashwagandha, not getting anhedonia. So I wanna discuss who is likely to get anhedonia from ashwagandha, and then also what you can do about it. I wanna discuss the exact mechanism of action so you can understand why it happens and why you might be predisposed to something like that. All right, so let's dive in. The reason one is because ashwagandha has been shown to increase serotonin and an excessive amount of serotonin is associated with anhedonia. So this was a human study where they used 500 milligrams of a 2.5% withanolide extract once daily. So it wasn't very high. And then this was urinary dopamine and serotonin. You can see the dopamine went up a little bit, serotonin went up a little bit. So it increases your neurotransmitters, which, which can be good for both because when you're chronically stressed, dopamine and serotonin tends to drop so when you increase them and even just a little bit could have beneficial effects on your mood now when serotonin increases too much in relation to your dopamine this can contribute to anhedonia but i don't think this is the main reason why ashwagandha causes anhedonia now keep in mind that everyone is different in terms of their neurotransmitters like for example your tyrosine hydroxylase and tryptophan hydroxylase which creates dopamine and serotonin could be under or over expressed in you versus someone else also the enzymes that break down serotonin like the monoamine oxidase a could be under expressed so if you increase serotonin just a little bit for you that might be a massive amount because the breakdown is not very high so in relation to someone else, that might be an excessive amount of serotonin for you, right? But you can see this on DNA testing to see if your monoamine oxidase A is underexpressed or not to see if this is really the problem for you. But as I mentioned, I don't think this is the problem, but this is reason one why it might contribute to anhedonia, but I don't think this is the main reason. All right, so reason two is because it drops cortisol. I'm going to explain exactly why this is an issue. So there's not a lot of evidence on this, but we know that ashwagandha can lower cortisol. Some studies show that it doesn't lower cortisol. Other studies show that it does lower cortisol. And in this specific case study, it was one individual. This happened to this person. So this was a random cortisol blood test before starting ashwagandha, right? And then this person started using ashwagandha and their cortisol dropped by almost half. And what they did in the study, they gave this individual ACTH, synthetic ACTH. So your pituitary releases ACTH that stimulates the adrenal glands to create cortisol. So what happened, this person had severe adrenal hypofunction. So it did not respond to ACTH. And when the person stopped ashwagandha, cortisol still remained low. So this was two weeks after stopping ashwagandha. Cortisol was still low, but then the adrenals responded to ACTH. So the responsiveness was back, but cortisol was still low two weeks after stopping it. So the, the product that this person used was called clean ashwagandha. They took the two capsules, which was equivalent to 850 milligrams of the ashwagandha extract, containing 21 milligrams of withanolide, plus 95 milligrams of um, the manufacturer's uptake blend, which is probably piperine, which is a black pepper extract. And what happened is that it lowered cortisol and caused adrenal hypofunction, as I mentioned here. And long-term use can cause permanent adrenal hypofunction. This is what they speculated. So even if you stop ashwagandha, your adrenal glands is not producing enough cortisol. As you can see, like two weeks after stopping it, cortisol was still low. It causes uh, adrenal hypofunction. And then they say that cortisol reduction should indeed be interpreted as an adverse effect of ashwagandha rather than a benefit if you are healthy. Obviously, if you're stressed and your cortisol is very high, using ashwagandha can be extremely helpful to bring that high cortisol down. But if you're healthy and your cortisol is already in a healthy range and it's dropping even more, that could be seen as a pathological adaption, not as a beneficial adaption. All right. So the reason why I'm talking about cortisol is related to adrenaline production. So this is tyrosine. Tyrosine hydroxylase converts it into L-dopa. L-dopa is converted into dopamine. And then your dopamine is converted to norepinephrine by dopamine beta hydroxylase. And then norepinephrine is converted into epinephrine with the help of SAMe, a methyl donor, right? By this enzyme, phenylethanolamine in methyltransferase or PN PNMT for short. 
So cortisol induces this PNMT enzyme that converts norepinephrine into epinephrine. Right? So if you're dropping your cortisol, your norepinephrine will stay the same or go up a little bit, or it and your epinephrine will drop. Right? So both of these are catecholamines. So I had a look at Addison's disease, people with low cortisol, to see if there's a difference between their catecholamines. And it turns out people with Addison's disease, and this is male, right? So this is healthy males, and this is people with Addison's disease. Adrenaline was significantly lower in people with low cortisol compared to healthy individuals. Their norepinephrine levels were normal, but their adrenaline levels was very low. And this is because they have very low cortisol and they don't stimulate this enzyme enough, leading to low levels of norepinephrine. So dopamine, norepinephrine, and adrenaline are important for erections. So the studies found that epinephrine and norepinephrine are involved in erections, and alterations in their levels has been observed in patients with erectile dysfunction. And I'll discuss that, and I'll show you exactly um, what's happening between the individuals that's normal and ED. So also they did a study, adult male rats were treated with finasteride, Ex vivo analysis indicated that epinephrine levels were decreased by finasteride treatment in adrenal glands, while those of norepinephrine were increased. And I'll discuss the similarities between ashwagandha and finasteride in their alterations with uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine in just a moment. So here's high adrenaline, right? We don't want to have high adrenaline and we don't want to have low adrenaline. So high adrenaline causes nervousness, anxiety, jitteriness, and jumpiness. It causes sweatiness, specifically like in your hands, like your that, that's a nervous sweatiness. ED, because it's too much constriction. So when you have too much stimulants, right, like caffeine or if you heme bind, those kind of stuff that's excessive stimulating, it can contribute to ED. They call it stim, stim, stimulation-induced ED or something like that. It can contribute to premature ejaculation, hypersensitivity of the penis. Then we have low adrenaline which causes penile insensitivity, poor erections, anhedonia, low energy, low excitement about things, not easily frightened, and not easily frightened. Right, so this is typically what people might experience when they say they get anhedonia from ashwagandha. There's actually low adrenaline that's causing it. So here are adren noradrenaline involvement in erections. We have healthy individuals, we have psychogenic ED, and we have organic ED. Right, so they have the cavernosum vein adrenaline levels. You can see this is when it's flaccid, and then it's getting stiff, and then it's stiff, and then it go back to flaccid again. So you can see that as you're getting a boner, your noradrenaline levels drop. And this was the arm vein. So when you check the arm, noradrenaline levels are different from the cavernosum vein noradrenaline levels. So it's a local change in your catecholamines and not the serum level change, for example. And this is what's also found in testosterone. Right? When you get an erection, your penile testosterone goes up, but the blood testosterone doesn't uh, change as much as the penile testosterone. So norepinephrine changes. The level is about 360, drops down to about 240. Right? When you have psychogenic ED, it goes from 280, to 340 maybe, right? So it's going up when you get an erection. So when you don't have ED, when you're getting an erection, it's about 280, and here it's also about like 300. So it's more or less the same between psychogenic ED and being healthy, and here it's 270 when you have organic ED. So there doesn't appear to be much of a difference in norepinephrine levels between healthy, psychogenic ED, or organic ED. And then when you look at adrenaline secretions between healthy, psychogenic, and organic, when you are getting an erection, your adrenaline levels are going to about 130. But when you have psychogenic, it goes to about 90. And when you have organic, it goes to about 70, right? So your adrenaline levels spike when you get an erection, but when you have psychogenic or organic ED, it doesn't spike as much, which indicates that low levels of adrenaline contribute to ED. Now, I also want to indicate that finasteride inhibits this PNMT enzyme. And what happens is that finasteride causes an increase in penile testosterone and a decrease in penile DHT, despite not changing testosterone in the serum. So it's not changing in the serum, but it goes up. And then you can see noradrenaline going up with finasteride treatment and epinephrine levels going down. And this is what's contributing to erectile dysfunction. It's this decrease in epinephrine how to interpret cortisol tests. 
you have a serum cortisol test, you have salivary cortisol test, and you have a urinary cortisol test, like the Dutch test. So when you go to the doctor, you check your serum levels, it's some good information because it indicates how much cortisol your body is producing, like the total amount of cortisol that your body is producing at that moment. That's all that it shows you. It doesn't show you the rhythm. It doesn't show you how much of it's free. It doesn't show you how much is being metabolized, right? So a serum test, you should never interpret your cortisol levels just based on a serum test. It's really a very poor way of showing like your cortisol levels in the body. What you want to do is you want to also look at your salivary cortisol, which is a better indication of free cortisol and also the rhythm of your cortisol during the day. It's like a four point cortisol test because your level could be low in the morning, but it could be high in the evening or it could be high in the morning and then stays high during the rest of the day. So this is a much better indication of your daily rhythm of cortisol. You want to do a salivary cortisol test. But then you also want to do a urinary cortisol test like the Dutch test. So this can show you your total DHEA production and also the metabolized cortisol by 5-alpha reductase. And it can show you your daily free cortisone to cortisol. So it's how your body is activating the inactive cortisol into the active cortisol. right? So if your NAD levels are low, your cortisol will be high in relation to your cortisone. And you can also see the rhythm of cortisone to cortisol. And as I mentioned here, you can see the 5-alpha reductase metabolites of cortisol. So you have the 5-alpha reductase of cortisone, the 5-alpha reductase metabolites of cortisol. So you can see which one is being excessively metabolized by 5-alpha reductase. And here you can also see the total metabolized cortisol. So all of these markers are extremely important to interpret your cortisol. Like the serum level will indicate how much you're producing. Then you have the urinary, which will show you the rhythm again during the day and how it's being metabolized and how it's being activated in the body. All of which will give you so much more info just than just doing a serum test. So in summary, the main reason why ashwagandha causes anhedonia is because it drops cortisol, which is then insufficient stimulation for PNMT. So you'd have a drop in epinephrine, which is then causing that loss of sensitivity, poor erections. You're not being excited about things in life anymore. It's due to low epinephrine and low cortisol, not serotonin, low cortisol, low norepinephrine. And you don't know how you're responding to ashwagandha unless you do tests. You want to know, is my cortisol excessively dropping? Just because the studies are showing that it, cortisol doesn't drop, for example, doesn't mean yours is not going to drop. And it's also how your adrenal glands are responding to ACTH and becoming hypofunctional, right? So your cortisol is just remaining low at all times. So if you're perhaps one of those people, but you really love ashwagandha, like it really helps you to manage your stress and your anxiety, just take a much lower dose, right? Try to use a full spectrum perhaps not even an extract because an extract makes it more powerful. So you just get like the ashwagandha powder that's not extracted and use like 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams of a non-extract to get the same benefits, but without the excessive decrease in cortisol. And if your cortisol is low, then you can use something like adrenal support supplements, like maybe like glandular, vitamin B5, vitamin C, maybe some ligarish to bring up your cortisol. And this will help to resolve some of these symptoms. All right, so I hope this was really helpful and you learned something new. If you would like to learn how to maximize your testosterone, I have a free ebook link in the description below. And thanks for watching this video. If you found it insightful, share it to other people so they can also learn about this cortisol connection. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I'll check you in the next one. Cheers.